Good afternoon, folks, and hello. Welcome to another Flycast Partners presentation. My name is Rich Longo, Flycast Partners, and I would like to thank you for joining us for the Power of Unified IT series. Today's webinar is our fifth and final installment of the five-part series, Ivante's Unified Endpoint Security Webinar presented by Jed Wilson. Jed presented for us last week, and we definitely appreciate Jed joining us today. And he's been a sales engineer, consultant, support engineer, and technical support for Vontae and Landesk since 2006. He has hands-on experience and knowledge with AppSense, Shavlik, and extraction tools. His knowledge even transcends into Avanti's IT service management and asset management solutions. Jed has had a front row seat to the unified IT transformation in Avanti and is very knowledgeable about the direction of where they're headed with it. Before we get started, Jed, let me introduce Flycast Partners. Flycast Partners is here to deliver a seriously amazing IT experience. We are founded and staffed by personnel that have many years of experience in the IT space. We took the best ideas from these collective experiences and added the best components necessary to grow and become a leading value-added reseller in the North American IT market. We offer best-in-class implementation services and training in IT service management, IT asset management, and IT operations management, enterprise service management, and workload automation spaces using ITIL best practice. Our professional services can easily scale up or down to meet the IT needs of any customer, regardless of size, complexity, or budgetary restrictions. We offer implementation services both on-site and remote, as well as training to reinforce your company's long-term IT success. Our ongoing remote administration support service offerings will enable your organization to focus on those normal day-to-day -day operations, saving you both precious time and money. I encourage you to feel free to call us at 844-FLYCAST, that's 844-359-2278, or simply visit our website at www.flycastpartners.com. We have IT experts ready, standing by to answer your questions live Monday through Friday during normal business hours. This is just one of many of our weekly webinars that we have going on here at Flycast Partners. I encourage you to take a look at the various topics we have upcoming. Sign yourself up, sign your coworkers up, sign up a friend. I also encourage you to take a look at some of the events that we have going up in the coming up in the near future. We have a road show coming to a city near you. I encourage you to sign up for that. Uh, hosting at Dave and Buster's, where we'll get a chance to meet with the fellow peers within your space, get a chance to have a good meal, listen to a couple talks, and play some video games. I encourage you to take a look at some of the the uh, Houston Roundup that Ivante has coming up on their calendar on September 19th. That should be a great event, a, a rather large event, as a matter of fact, so I encourage you to sign up for that. Utilize our website to download those data sheets and white papers of items that you've wanted to know about, that you've needed to see and learn about, but have not uh, – been able to have a chance to have a first-hand look at. So with that being said, I also want to talk to you about our contest that we have going on here at Flycast Partners. We have a contest going on that will enable you to, or to get a gift card to Starbucks <clears throat> that you can utilize at your leisure. And we have a code that will be coming up. They'll be flashed for only a couple of seconds, all right? And we see the code, simply type it back to the host privately through chat, and you'll receive a Starbucks gift card uh, the next morning or next afternoon. You have two minutes to type the code after it is shown. It will be invalid after that. In addition, for all of those of you that attend all five webinars in this series, you will have, and if, uh, you'll have an opportunity to be entered in a drawing for an Oculus. If you have any questions during our presentation at all, today, I encourage you to type those in the Q&A section provided in this WebEx presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of those questions as possible as time allows. Jed is more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So please, take the time, type the questions in, I'll read them off to Jed, and Jed will answer what he can during our presentation today. Jed, I'm turning this over to you, sir. Go ahead and uh, run with it. It's all you. 
Thanks, sir. Let's go ahead and get started. All right. Well, first, uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of PowerPoint. So let me get that going. And we'll try to keep it a little bit. We'll try to keep it as short as possible. But let's go ahead and introduce some some information about us. First thing is, uh, let me introduce Avanti. So Avanti, we were established in 1985. We're privately owned. Our we have a headquarters in Salt Lake City. We work with over 27,000 different customers. And we manage over 47 million different endpoints. Avanti wants to help organizations reduce risks and costs associated with managing their IT environment and supporting the business and their end users. What makes us unique in our approach to changing how IT works, helping organizations, <laughs> what makes us unique is our approach in how changing how IT works, helping organizations identify these critical functions with shared data, processes, and automation. This is the Avanti DNA, and it makes us who we are. There you can see through organic growth and acquisitions we've done over the years, we've uh, we've continued to add to our profile, and we've we've might moved into five main areas of focus. Those five main areas of focus are security, which we're going to be talking about today, unified endpoint management, IT asset management, IT service management, and identity management. Foundational to those is our integrated and automated uh, <coughs> platforms whether they're cloud or on-prem, and then our integrated analytics and reporting tools. It allows us to discover, to provide insight, and to take action. Our goal is to lower your risk, to uh, uh, help you provide a quicker response time, to increase your user's, user satisfaction, and give you time to be strategic. But we're talking about security data today. And all top, uh, of, of all the top, type, top cybersecurity firms, uh, in, say the top the cybersecurity threats including malware, phishing, and cyber attacks are, are, are attempting to steal in financial information, intellectual property, or data. They're all on the rise, all those threats. In, in the U.S. alone, there were 501 publicly disclosed data breaches in 2016, 803 in 2017, 945 representing 4.5 billion data records in 2018. The, re the threat is real and it escalates every year. The uptick is in no small part due to how much easier it is to take up the mantle of a cyber attacker. Today's exploit kits, for example, simplify cyber attacks for even inexperienced hackers. These malicious toolkits come with pre-written exploit code that require no knowledge of how it works. Often a simple web interface allows licensed users to log in and view active victims and statistics. These kits may have include a support period and updates, much like legal commercial software. For its part, ransomware has evolved from being a simple, scary hack to enterprise grade, nearly unbeatable malware that holds ho computers hostage in lockdown systems. Combine that with the fact that nearly 40% of all spam emails sent in 2016 contain ransomware, and it's clear that at any point any, any, an, 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 an unassuming user may click on something that they shouldn't. The research conducted by the IBM X Force found that one in two executives have experienced a ransomware attack at work. That's potentially half of the executives in your organization. At alarming rates, users with many devices are falling victim to ransomware and other malware via user targeted attacks. According to the Verizon Risk Team, 30% of phishing messages were opened up, up from 23% in 2015. And in 12% of those events, users clicked to open the malicious attachment or nefarious link. A typical three pond phishing attack looks, follows the, kind of this process. The user receives a phishing email with a malicious attachment or a link pointing to a malicious website. The user downloads that malware, which attackers can use, can use to look for secrets and internal information. They can steal credentials to multiple applications through key logging or even encrypt files for ransom. Attackers can then use the stolen credentials for further attacks, for example, to log into third-party websites like banking or retail sites. You don't want to be one of the 70% of corner businesses that pay up when hit by ransomware to gain, regain access to business and data systems. Well, what do you do when you have so little time to react? 93% of data breaches compromise organizations in, a, in minutes or less. The money maintains a big draw for the criminals, which means you could be in position sooner than you think. Ransomware cost businesses more than $8 billion in 2018. Today, you simply can't afford to make the wrong call when it comes to securing your organization. What can make your organization more vulnerable to a cyber attack is a lack of synergy between IT operations and security. What if your security team discovers a breach, for example, but your IT ops, your IT ops team is slow to react? Or IT ops, or IT ops corrects an application 
failure that is actually a system hack with more surface area to cover, more mission critical assets to protect, and more sophisticated threats to defend against, but security threats are increasingly complex. So these two teams must find a way to work together to better identify and protect vulnerable IT systems. On our behalf, global, uh, the global advisory firm Chertoff Group surveyed 100 CIOs and CSOs in October 2016 to determine what they considered to be the most important security challenges in managing their endpoints today. The results revealed a desire to redefine IT operations and security, and a clear understanding of the benefits bringing them together under one strategy. They also re revealed an awareness of the need for a simpler, more focused security solution. According to Chertoff Group's findings, organizations are being squeezed by budgets yet again. Though the money flows more freely for security than IT, they still struggle to maintain their security posture with flat or de decreasing budgets. Without a focused IT strategy, though, the device, device for all is costly, also out of control. IT teams spend too much time managing security. Add to this a major security labor shortage that forces companies to optimize their security personnel and clearly a, and clearly a focused security strategy leveraging tech that's both comprehensive and simplifies management offers a strong advantage over those solutions. So the, you're going you're gonna to run into a lot of these different problems along the way, and how, do, how are we going to take care of it? Well, making, let's, to make sense of, the, of this from an endpoint security perspective, Chris Sherman, who's a researcher for Forrester, Forrester Tech Radar, the head endpoint security area, a senior analyst, at, he's a senior analyst at Forrester, he examined past research, he surveyed some experts, and he experimented with endpoint security products to determine the following about the, the industry and those products. What is their current business value? What's their potential business value? What's the current market maturity? What's the, what's the time to the next stage of maturity? His key takeaways were, from the report were, endpoint security is critical to defend, for defense against data breaches. Security pros need to balance prevention and detection, and consolidation of technology is gonna to lead to a lot more effective suites. Sherman had a great many other uh, others champ and many others champ champion a more focused solution. Carefully selecting the, uh, the right integrated solutions provide a complete view of the network environment, a comprehensive security that pinpoints issues anywhere in your organization, and finally threat mitigation where protecting and even boot and that even protects and boosts your productivity. So what's the Avanti approach to security? We're gonna, we want it to discover, then we want to provide insight, and we want to take action. What do we mean by discover, provide insight, and take action? First, know what we need, you need to know what's in your environment because you can't protect or defend against anything you don't know is out there. Next, we want to patch the applications that support patching, block the ones that don't. We want to add anti-malware and AV capabilities, device control, and global policy management for all devices. And finally, we want to marry those security capabilities with workflows and asset management processes to complete a secure life cycle to unify all those five pillars and unify IT in general. Finally, you need to know your results. Since you have no real defense without real insight in your environment, extraction is, wants, is going to return reporting into a checkbox. With data on demand and ability to create new dashboards and reports to get the right data in the hands of executives, directors, and line of business and other application owners. Pre-built connectors for every tool you use, whether it's service desks, monitoring, I ITAM tool sets, phone NAT systems, et cetera, they mean no coding, business application, business intelligence gurus, no spreadsheets, and definitely no data silos. Extraction can be customized to connect to even more, so everyone can view their data enterprise-wide in context, cutting through the massive information to, to those critical insights that matter to make smarter, faster decisions with ease. Security compliance. So the CIS, uh, the Center for Internet Security, uh, is you know they recommend a sophisticated multi-layered approach to security to mitigate those otherwise you know devastating effects of ransomware and other malware. So them and other watchdogs are they're trying to contribute their knowledge to you know and expertise to identify, validate, promote, and sustain the adoption of cybersecurity's best practices. Those first five controls from the CIS critical security controls, CSC1 through CSC5, they establish a solid foundation for radically improving an organization's posture. They refer to these as foundational cyber hygiene. 
Avanti wants to help you do that. They are inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices. We want to help you inventory authorized and unauthorized software. We want to secure the configuration of those end user devices. We want to help you continuously um, provide uh, vulnerability assessment and remediation and control the use of administrative, administrative privileges. How important are those controls for your organization? Configuring IT systems in compliance with those CIS benchmarks have been shown to eliminate 80 to 95 percent of known security vulnerabilities. So let's talk about the Avanti product suite and how it fits into that. First place we're going to start off with is what we call our security controls uh, tool, and we're going to break that into two parts here. But let's, first, we want to start with patch. So, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> this model shows the life of vulnerability and the time to patch to resolve that vulnerability. Even before an update releases, there are risk of zero-day vulnerabilities and that are being exploited. Public di disclosures off that expose the vulnerability to the public and threat actors in, in advance of that update and unknown vulnerabilities waiting to be discovered by vendors, white hats, and black hats. Day zero is the day an update is released. From this point forward, the risk of an exploit in increases over time. At around 14 days, the risk of an exploit of a vulnerability starts to increase vulnerability, uh, significantly. According to the Verizon DBIR group, within two to four weeks, 50% of vulnerabilities that will be exploited have been exploited. At 40 to 60 days, 90% of, of vulnerabilities that ha have been exploited will be exploited. And um, in 2016, the average time to patch was around 100 to 120 days. This means that threat actors were actively exploiting vulnerabilities for two to three months before the vulnerabilities were remediated. In 2016, there were 6,447 CVEs reported and captured by the CVE details. The average time to patch was 100 to 120 days, according to the Verizon DBIR. In 2017, there was a significant increase in CVEs as bug bounties increased across the industry and new vendors started reporting vulnerabilities like Internet of Things devices and other vendors who did not previously report vulnerabilities. Oop. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> in 2018, there were over 16,000 vulnerabilities. As you can see, the volume of security vulnerabilities continue to decrease over, year over year and will likely to continue, will continue to do so um, ahead of time. Uh, uh, some time. So how can we stay ahead of those threats? Many companies are going to struggle to do so and resolve those, those vulnerabilities quickly. This is where Avanti Security Controls patch comes in. Key features of it are we offer it will offer agentless and agent-based patching, a really tight VMware integration which allows us to patch your hypervisors or their VMware or ESXi. We're going to be able to patch those templates, bring them up, shut them down. We're able to take snapshots prior and post to those those patches, and um, we're able to manage those snapshots as they go forward. We're able to import your CVEs, so if you're using a Tenable, a Rapid7, a Nessus, a Qualys type scanner, we can import those and we can start patching those based on whatever your security group gives to you. And finally, the unparalleled Avanti content. Avanti is going to provide content for over 150 third-party vendors and, their, and their, all the CVEs associated with their software. The core components of the product are going to be machine groups. We're going to be able to define where, how, our machines, uh, how our machines are going to be patched and what type of grouping. Our scan templates, so what are we going to scan for? What, are we, you know, what patches do we care about? What vendors do we care about? We're going to give you control over that. The, de on the deployment templates, we're going to tell you how to deploy it, how to control our reboots when we do those snapshots, for example. And then agent policies. We can configure the agent to check in on its own schedule. We can have it check in over the internet for that patching. The next part of the Avanti security controls is application control. If we go back to the Verizon DBIR, last year the Verizon risk team found phishing is used in more than 90% of security incidents and breaches. Similarly, in 2018 they found email continues to be the most common vector for those breaches, walking with a staggering 96% of the blame. And 40% of malware gets installed via email. Stopping that malware from being downloaded and executed cannot be ignored. According to the Verizon Risk Team, 4% of recipients in any phishing campaign will, will click on a malicious link or attachment. All it takes is one person. Given this, is there any wonder phishing plays such a, a prominent role in attacks? Your organizations have the ability to block all this content. If you, <clears throat> 80 to 95% of Windows intrusion 
threats are implemented by four key by using with four key disciplines can be can be stymied by using four key disciplines. One, we're going to patch the operating system and patch applications. That's what we talked about with the uh, previous section. And then we have application whitelisting and admin privileges. This is where application control comes to involved. Finally, we have, there's and what you're not seeing here is also device control, which we'll talk, we can talk about at some time. One of the things you need to balance, though, with your security compliance is, is various demands. You have your end user demands that want a fast and easy to use uh, an environment that doesn't require a lot of hoops to jump through. The IT pro demands that they have everything's contextual, that they have information about that information, and that they that they can provide all that personalization and that uh, and to enable your end users. And then the security pro, pro is going to demand security. They want they want to they want to know what applications are machine. They want to control those things. They want to control privilege management. They want to con they want NAC network access control and those type of tools. So how do we do that? How do we balance IT and, and user and user needs? Your users want freedom. Your IT wants control. So how, what do we need to do that? So with application control, it gives us privilege management for all this application access. It specifies what applications can, can run with Avalon privileges. It restricts user rights for that application. It gives an, it gives us an alternate approach for user rights elevation. And you know, I had a I was recently talking to a customer that they they were looking for an application like this because they had a bunch of Autodesk software that required admin credentials and they need to remove those from their machines. This is going to help us do that. We offer self-elevation, so the users can self-elevate based on the settings that you define. Self-elevation allows those end users to get admin privileges when they require them to run an application. This allows administrators to remove admin rights in their environment, but still allows specific users to the ability to elevate their privileges for certain apps if they need to. Application manager, self-elevation in, in it, in application manager, self-elevation is extended to ex support all file types. And administrators may specify certain file types may be only elevated when open with certain applications. For example, a VBS script with a wscripting.exe application. Then we're going to offer privilege manager to the control panel. So this allows us the users with install ActiveX components to join their li their laptop to public Wi-Fi. It allows developers to run Visual Studio with the admin rights they require. We can restrict system settings access. So we can allow or disallow the users to access the firewall settings. We can prevent we can prevent specific services from being stopped. So if you if you have a problem with your end users stopping their semantic service, we can we can stop that with application management. Anyway, let's go ahead and let me go ahead and switch over and we'll go we'll move into the demo. There's no questions while I'm doing that here. All right. As of right now, we don't have any questions, but folks, please, by all means, go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A section of this WebEx. I'll read them off to Jed and he'll answer as many as he possibly can with the time that we have allocated today. So please don't be bashful. Type those questions. Thank you, Rich. Uh, can you see my screen now? I want to make sure that everybody's on board with me. It looks perfect. It looks great. Thank you. Well, the way I typically like to start off this demo, when, when you talk about any Avanti product, is I like to talk about extraction. It's that foundational reporting and analytics tool that we're going to, that foundational one that's, that underpins all of our product for pillars, gives you that centralized reporting. Right now, we're looking at patching information from our, from our, from our ISEC tool. This is a nice, this, this gives us a lot of functionality here. You can see the data from presented in a number of different ways, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn off my rotation real quick, and I'm going to walk you quickly through what that looks like. First thing is, it allows me to easily drill down to any of the data that I want. So if I click here, I can view my records, and it'll give me this information about this, uh, about all these applications that I have right here very quickly. I can actually go ahead and I can drill down really, very seamlessly by adding a filter on it, and it'll drill down these other ones, and you can see here it drops me down to these, to these 20 counts. Then I can, if I wanted to see that 20 count of software that has those critical vulnerabilities, I can do that. That helps me instantly get down that software. I can also export this data really quickly by going to my export and choosing which format that I wish to use. And I can also pr provide direct links to this software, to these dashboards themselves. If I go ahead and I provide this link, that allows me to provide a link to my end users or my management, provide, show them that I'm making use of the tool and the tool is useful for me and there's value there. Because as everybody knows, if I can't report on it, then the job's not done. I can actually create to, I can create dashboards in here really quickly to do that. I want to go ahead and demonstrate how to create a antivirus dashboard, and then we'll go ahead and move into the main product. 
So this tool is really simple. All I'm doing right here is I'm dragging and dropping. With extraction, this is we're provide we provide this tool as an entitlement to any other of our product you, um, our product licenses. Everyone will have the ability to use this wherever they want. It's very customizable, easy to use. I'm just dragging and dropping here. It, it actually talks to these databases, most databases in real time, including all the Avanti databases. It allow, that allows us to make sure that our that data is as live as possible. There's no data warehousing. There's no data replication there. Anyway, I can go ahead and I'm going to add a few more columns. And then once I have that done, then I'll have a pretty complete antivirus dashboard and with just a few clicks using extraction. Anyway, so that, that's what my, my, uh, my antivirus dashboard is going to look like. Let's go ahead and move into the main product. So this is the main product that we're going to be talking about today. We call it Avanti Security Controls. You can see over here on the left, I have our patch management and we have our application control solution. They're running side by side. We're going to continue to broaden this as we go forward. We have a standalone device control product that is going to eventually be integrated in there, but right now it's standalone. But that will be all integrated in the same console here. First thing you need to know about patch management with, with uh, Avanti security controls is it's very easy. One number one thing I can do here is I can do a new agentless operation. If I go ahead and click on that, all I need to do is choose which workstations or servers I wish to scan and then tell it when I want to run. If I wanted to have my scan run every on, on say, the, every, the second Tuesday plus three days, that would put me on the Friday after Patch Tuesday. Then I can choose how I want to stage the software, the updates, and then I can choose how I want to install it. I can put in scheduling here to add some, uh, so that there's a little bit of lag between those things if I'd like to, and that allow me to schedule it out. But for right now, let's just go ahead and run an agentless scan, and we'll show you what that looks like. Right now, I'm going to scan seven machines. You can see it quickly updated my the definitions, the content that we have. Again, Avanti provides uh, <coughs> vulnerability data for over 150 different vendors. We're going to put it all in the same place. That all comes down as metadata from our servers. We have a team that creates this metadata. Anytime we find a new CVE or a new patch from a vendor, we're going to make that available to you. That metadata has three major components to it. It's going to have information about what devices require the update. It's going to have information about where that device that updates down is going to be downloaded from, where we'll keep it local in the begin um, for distribution. And then finally, how to install that software. Anyway, so that's going to go. That's going to run, and that's going to scan all those machines based on the information. This is an agentless scan. I don't have anything running right now. All I need is to be able to, to uh, an admin. Uh, all I need is an admin account so that I can schedule these. So I can scan these machines. If I click on view results here. It's going to take me to my results window, and it's going to help me. It's going to tell me some information about those machines. Well, if I look at my Windows 10 machine here, you can see here I have a number of different columns I can sort based on. Let's just go ahead and uh, product level missing. So that's the only thing that's missing on this machine. You can see I have one product level missing. I have two end of life products, and I have a bunch of installed updates. But right now, this one's recommending I install um, make Windows 10 19.03 for my devices. Now we're going to go. We're going to finish up those other ones here. It's downloading patches, and then. But this will allow me to see all that information. If I look at one of my older scans here, right here, you'll see that I'm also scanning my servers using that same agentless scan, and it's telling me all these patches that are missing for it. Well, if I look across these lists, it's going to give me information about the patch down below when I highlight that. It's going to give me the bulletin ID, the bulletin title, the CVS, calculated CVSS score, the CVEs associated with it, any IAVAs associated with it, and the, and, and the bit, the other bits of information about it. That's going to all provide as my results, and then I can choose how I want to stage and install that software. That here. Oop. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so while we're while we're while that's coming back up, we have the we're going to provide those results. You can take action on them. You get to choose when you want those when you want those scans to happen or how you want them to happen. But before we do that, we need to define the next thing we need. But before, when we get started, we need to define how we want our machine groups to be. I we want to specify those. To do that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new machine group. And this allows me to define my groups based on how, whatever criteria I want. So I'm going to kind of go out of order here. But what I want you to see is, number one, I'm going to set, my, set the credentials that I want to. And I'm going to use a domain admin in my environment. But it could be anyone that has local admin rights. Up top, you're going to see right here, I can choose to scan if only certain conditions exist, like workstations or servers. This allows me to, number one, I can specify by device name if I'd like to. And I could specify those, I could have a bunch of device names and link to a file if I had, if I wanted to set it up that way. 
I can I can scan the whole domain. So if I want to do my whole domain, and I wanted to only have my workstations, I could specify it that way. Over here in IP address ranges, I can specify by single IP address addresses. I can do it by range. I can use IPv6, and I can also link it to a file with that, that contains those addresses. I also have the ability to exclude using these boxes right here. I can exclude individuals or ranges or add individuals. Anyway, I also can specify using organizational units, which is the most common way of doing things. But if I go in here and I have browse, I can browse my directory and I can tell it based on my OUs what I want to scan. So if I want to scan just my Paris OU, I have that ability and that'll send, that'll insert that down there. Now a couple of things I haven't shown you are my hosted virtual machines. So for, if I have a hypervisor such as vCenter or ESX, I can add that hypervisor in here and I can patch that hypervisor and I can also patch the temp, all, all the machines and templates that it hosts. And down later when we start deployment, we can talk about how we're going to manage those snapshots. Also for VMware, we have the ability to manage those VMware machines with the same, with the same capabilities. We can take those machines and we can update them as VMs. Anyway, so that's why we're going to define our, our machine groups. Next thing is we want to define our <coughs> We want to define our patch temp, our patch scan templates. This is this is where we're going to define what we want to scan for. So if I go into a new patch scan template, I have the ability to choose by vendor. You can see over here I have a lot of different vendors available to me, and I can break that down into different products. So if I didn't want to scan for you know Acrobat Five, I didn't have to, I wouldn't have to do that. Over here I have the ability to ex specifically exclude software from it too. If I just wanted to not scan for it, I wanted to specifically exclude those, I could. Maybe I didn't want to scan for my newer versions because like, an update would cause problems there. I can have the ability to do that. So I have the ability to do that. Uh, all those, make those, identify my scan information based on all those. I can also base it on whether I want to do security patches, not security patches, security tools. I also have the ability to do some whitelisting and blacklisting of my patches. If I wanted to use a, if I wanted to define a group of patches, say based on a, a group that I have defined previously, I all I do is put those patches into that group, and then I can set that as my baseline when I do this scan. I can also have it as an, as an exception to my, to the main scans that I have set up here. Anyway, that's going to help me define where, who, what, what machine groups are going to define what devices I scan, and then this patch scan template is going to define what content I scan for. After I choose what I want to scan for in, my, in, in there, I need to define a, a deployment template. It's going to define how that software update's deployed and how it's installed. Well, first thing is I can choose how I want to interact with different server types, whether they're SQL Server or IIS, IIS Server. I also can remove temp files. I can show a dialog during the execution if I'd like to. I can handle pre-deployment reboots if I want to. I can schedule that. Um, I can I can um, alert, alert the user if I wish to. I can allow a sample countdown right here, and it, well, this one is going to log when I it's going to run when I log off. So I have the ability to do that with a pre-deployment reboot, reboot. I also have the same capabilities with a post-deployment reboot if I want to notify the user or force that down. When my deployment happens, I have the ability to force to to email a report automatically to whomever I have de identified here. So I could deploy my note my deployment notification report to my system administrator here. As when this deployment kicks off. I have the ability to find custom app, uh, actions. So whether that's an, a script like a, a PowerShell-based script, I can specify that in here and have that run. My distribution servers are my distribution points that I have set up. So we're going to download that content from the manufacturer. We're going to save it locally. And then you have the ability to replicate that content to your distribution servers to keep that content very local. That way it doesn't go over your WAN links. And then finally, we have the ability to work with our hosted Templates, so I can take pre-deployment snapshots, post-deployment snapshots, and then I can manage how many I want to keep, and then I can manage how long I want to keep them. So that's how, briefly how I'm going to set up all my scans. Now I have the ability, like I said, to define who, what devices it's going to go to. I have the ability to define what content we're going to scan for, and then I have the ability to define, you know, what happens when that's installed. I can also specify agent policies. So if I don't want to run agentlessly, if I want to have my devices check in, that gives me the ability to schedule when those devices check in and how I want to do it. What a way I can do that here is the agent itself has a check-in period, which I, spe which I can specify here. And then I can specify how my reboots are going to happen when that device checks in. So I have the ability to force all of that. And then I have, then really the big thing is, is I want to scan, oh, I need to choose when I want my scan to happen. So then I can tell it to, to check in on a schedule. Maybe I want to check it in on an hourly schedule. And then I can randomize it and, and, run, and run, the, run it on boot if I want to.
Then I have the ability to define when my deploy, how my deploys happen. I can use my existing templates that you just saw me create, whether on scan or deployment. And then I have the ability to tell how I want to deploy those patches. And I can do this for Windows, as you can see, but I also have the ability to do so for Linux operating systems, which include Red Hat and CentOS. And that also gives me the ability. Um, we're going to be adding additional um, distros to that, including OS 10, Macintosh OS 10 should be coming in soon. Anyway, so that's all going to be all in one place. I'm going to go ahead and discard, discard those changes. But that's going to be the anatomy of how we set things up. One of the other things I didn't talk about is if you use your agent, uh, if you define an agent, you have the ability to use what we call the protect cloud. The protect cloud will communicate with our servers and allows these machines to check in over what we call the protect cloud and scan and repair those those um, whatever content you're providing. So they scan the content, and if they need to um, install an update, they're actually going to deploy. They're going to download that from the vendor. So if it's a Microsoft patch, they would download it from Microsoft. And this allows us to keep those machines that rarely, if ever, come on the network updated without having to, without doing an agent swap. Finally, the last thing I want to show you here is the ability to take those security scans that I'm sure you all are using, whether they're Tenable, they're Qualys, they're Nessus, they're Rapid7. We're going to be able to take those and we're going to be able to import them into a group. So if I go ahead here and I can browse, I have a Rapid7 scan. It's got a lot of CVEs in it. I'm going to go ahead and extract those CVEs. And it's going to go ahead and it's going to pull those. It's going to match them to the existing patch content that you've received from Avanti. We're going to match that, and then it's going to allow us to build a patch group. That's the one where I specified whether I wanted to use it as a baseline or a um, <clears throat> or a uh, <laughs> or an exceptions list. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and create that. And I'm going to update that, and then I'm going to close here, and then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to switch over to my patch templates and groups, and there's my Flycast demo one. You can see here if I double click on it, it's going to give me information about all those patches I just imported from. C from Rapid7. So anyway, that, that's what you're you going to get out of our security controls product for patching. Does anyone have any questions about any of that before I move into application control? We do have a question from uh, back when. If there is a patch that causes certain apps functionalities to malfunction, how hard is it to identify the patch and roll it back? Uh, it's going to be, you know, we, we, we give you the ability to, to roll it back. You, can have, you have the ability to uninstall these patches if, they support, if the patch supports it. It's going to be a matter of, we're going to report on that, so it'll be, you just need to go through some the, re, the information about what was installed and identify the individual patch and then roll it back. And that's all we have for Very cool. So the next thing is, is application control. And I talked about it during the, uh, during the PowerPoint. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to open up a configuration. And this is all about privilege management. So application control, it gives us the ability to control how things are going to be executed, what they're going to execute. There's two things you really need to know about this. One, we're going to give the users the self-elevate based on the configuration that you give them. And then two, we're going to determine who gets to execute things based on the one, a tool we call, it, but we call trusted ownership. First thing is in configuration settings, I can enable executable control, my privilege management, my, my browser control. If I go into in my executable control, this is where my trusted ownership takes, uh, takes precedence. I get to define if a file is owned by, an, by a particular user or a group, then it's allowed to be executed. And I can define this list however I wanted to. But that means anything that user downloads, whether it's from a browser or an email, if they're the owner of it, they're not going to be able to execute it unless, they have, unless you allow them to self-elevate one of those particular files. I have different options for how to configure these things as you go forward. Also in privilege management here, I can choose how, what, when, my users are allowed, when I allow my users to self-elevate, what they're able to elevate at. So if I, want to, if I, can give, if I give them the right to self-elevate, I can choose, I can allow them to um, use an executable and I, and I can associate that with another. And I, Depending on the file extension, I can execute it with another one, and I can choose how I want to how I want to configure this. I can also display a dialog box that requires information from the user before self elevation. My message settings: I have ability to message them when we're denying it, whether it's through executable control or privilege management. So you'll be able to say these privileges are restricted. But then I have the ability to define collections based on you know if this is my engineering group, I have mine defined for Autodesk software and my EndDrive that I've made available for my engineers. Um, then I can define my rule sets based on if they're in, in groups. So 
So this is my build administrators group. I'm going to give them the ability to install to run AutoCAD. They are self-authorizing. They have the ability to self-elevate. I could also deny things in here. It's easy to add to this list by right-clicking and going to File, Folder, Drive, File Collect, File Hash, or Rule Collection. I can also use when I get into Privilege Management. I'm going to I'm going to allow them to run some of my Lambda, my Avanti software. I can have them choose what I can choose what components they get to execute. In my case, these are my local administrators, so I'm going to give them access to um, my admin programs and a number of other things. If you look at my everyone, I under the under my components, I only give them access to my network connections, and data sources, and printers. Self elevation, you get to choose if they if they have self elevation. I can apply it to only to the to the items below, or I can I, I can apply it to all items except for those in the list below. So I can whitelist or blacklist. And then the system controls. I have the ability to commit to add a URL. This is browser control. I can choose what they get restricted, what sites get restricted or don't. That's all available in here. You can see I've blocked a torrent page for all my users. And then I can define that by user specifically. If I have a specific user that needs certain things, but I don't want to give them local admin rights, I can do that and I can, in, I can control it that way. I can base it on the device. So this one's based on my healthcare OU. I can base it on a scripted rule set so I can do some detection and, and use that. And then I can base it on the process itself. So I can base all these things, whether they're the executable control or they're privilege managers themselves, where we, when we access the OS, that's going to be all in the same place where you can control it based on the group, the user, the device, or you know, custom things like scripting and, and process control. Anyway, so that's a little bit overview of application control. It all lives in the same console. We're able to deploy it with the with our with our uh, patch management solution, and it's all in one place. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to take those. We've only got a couple minutes left. I apologize for taking up all the time, but I'll hand it back to you for it. To you, Rich. We do not have any. We don't have any questions right now. I think we're good. Uh, but we did have a lot of folks that were very interested in this topic. So very, uh, uh, thank you for that very much, folks. Uh, we did have a, a couple of folks that did qualify for the uh, coffee certificates. You'll have those tomorrow, and we'll have our drawing for. Uh, those folks that are, are eligible for the drawing for the Oculus, we'll go ahead and let that person know as soon as that, as soon as we have that drawing tomorrow. Uh, so we want to thank each and every one of you for attending our five uh, pillars of Unified IT series. I hope you got a great deal out of it. Should you have any questions, please reach out to us directly at 844-FLYCAST. That's 844-359-2278. Or email us at info at flycastpartners.com or visit us on our website and chat with one of our IT specialists Monday through Friday during normal business hours. Jed, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me, Rich. Thanks for everybody listening to me. Uh, folks, enjoy your Labor Day weekend. And until next time. Take care.